Premi Petey. Yay! Father Tucker. Right! Let's dig in! And of course, Cage and Alice from Rats on Cocaine. Their sloppy madcap adventures are fueled by blood, blasphemy, drugs, sex and death. They are loved by literally dozens of people around the world. But where did they come from? Who created them? And why won't they stop? Tonight, for the first time, we examine the remarkable story behind these animated abominations. This is the history of Apocalypse Cartoons. The man behind Apocalypse Cartoons is Dean Packis, although the term man is loosely used. Instead of a fleshy bipedal human, Packis is a hovering sphere of purple light in no way governed by the laws of physics or man. He is as intangible as he is unapproachable. Yet somehow he manages to write the scripts for all of his cartoons. He also provides the voices for nearly all of the characters. He even animates every frame of film himself. No one knows how he does it or why he isn't very good at it, but he has single-handedly produced several hours of unforgivably disgusting content, and it stretches back much further than some may realize. Dean Packis was first discovered in 1903. Famous American tycoon William Randolph Hearst was on holiday in Prussia when he observed the strange illumination as it floated through the wilderness. To nearby villagers, it was known as Dien Pactier Seals, meaning spirit who fears emotional intimacy. Hearst shortened the name to Dean Packis. The eccentric millionaire was determined to capture this lavender apparition and built an elaborate trap made of random parts such as copper-plated discs, a glass soda bottle, and a gram of mucus collected from the corners of the eyes of androgynous orphans. He succeeded in ensnaring Pacis and closely studied him. He watched as the ball of light grabbed a pencil and began doodling. Hearst quickly realized this being possessed rudimentary satirical skills. Always keen to utilize unpaid talent, he brought this luminescent anomaly back to the United States to work in his newspaper empire. Packis started in the editorial department, visually commenting on the news of the day. But in 1910, he moved on to his own surreal, serialized Sunday strip, Submissive Sue in Suffragette Land. In it, an obedient little girl discovers a magical world where women actually had civil rights. These strange and colorful adventures were widely stared at, but one minor character garnered unexpected attention. Premi Petey was a pink bastard fetus who survived being aborted with a wire coat hanger. Almost one person wrote in asking to see more of this semi-gestated youth. Soon, Petey was making regular appearances. In 1913, Packis chose to cancel Suffragette Land in favor of a new strip entitled An Apocalypse Cartoon. In this, Premi Petey slowly destroys the entire world in a bizarre series of events after accidentally killing Archduke Ferdinand of Austria. But Hearst was unhappy with this new direction, and Packis was fired. Homeless and destitute, he earned money by drawing caricatures of people's genitals. But this work soon dried up. The newest fad were Nickelodeon machines. They featured moving pictures of people's genitals. Packis became fascinated by these early experiments in mini-motion filmmaking and vowed to produce his own. In 1914, he spent nearly six months animating over 4,000 paper drawings until at last, his very first animation was complete. Audiences were bemused. Bolstered by this tepid reception, 
Pakis yearned to draw more short films, but he wanted to do it on his own terms. And so, through a fetid combination of perseverance and satanic dalliance, he opened Apocalypse Cartoon Studios in 1923. The building, which came to be known as Cokebug Cabana, was located on the sunny shores of Cleveland, Ohio, and was built over an ancient Hobbit burial ground. At first, a team of talented animators was hired, but Pakis soon fired them all after a disagreement about the Spanish-American War. Now and forever the sole animator, the studio's very first film featured his old friend, Premi P.T. Over time, more complex stories emerged which grew the Apocalypse cartoon stable of characters. One of the studio's last silent films featured a pointy-headed priest who struggled to hide his alcoholism. This of course was at the very height of the US prohibition on inebriants. But this unnamed priest would live on long after the constitutional ban on spirits was over. Audiences didn't immediately warm to this character, but Pakis saw the potential in this kindly priest with ulterior motives. He simply needed a twist. He soon realized that the rampant sexual molestation of children by trusted church leaders had, for some reason, been largely ignored by other animators of the day. And this clerical catamite craze was just the sort of high-spirited tomfoolery his cartoon preacher needed. He was christened Father Tucker, a play on the popular curse word, fucker, which was invented two years earlier by actress Lillian Gish. More importantly, Father Tucker was chosen to star in Apocalypse Cartoon's very first synchronized sound cartoon. With Pakis providing a high-pitched, lilting voice, this rebranded pedophile priest made his debut in 1928. Father Tucker had arrived. Many more of his films followed, and audiences lined up to see who he'd rape next. But Apocalypse Cartoon's biggest success was yet to come. Far back at the turn of the century, cocaine was everywhere. In our soda, our medicine, our shampoo, our heroin. But then, an all-new use for cocaine was discovered, unjustly imprisoning minorities. New laws cracked down on coke, and soon it was only associated with criminals and jazz musicians. Never one to shy away from controversy, Apocalypse Cartoons produced a drug-infused film about the ribald life of big band leader Glenn Miller. <laughs> 
Taste of your pretty white powder. If you want to get high, you'll have to sing. Now let me tell you about Jiminy Sniffer. He was a low down ass of ripper. He'd stick his feast right up your ass. Wiggle around, give it some gas. It was the studio's most popular cartoon to date, and while the singing female rat was intended as a supporting character, she easily outshined the star of the piece, Glenn Miller. Unfortunately, the real Glenn Miller was not consulted and objected to having his clean-cut image sullied with scurrilous drug allegations. He successfully sued Apocalypse Cartoons, and the film was banned from theatres. Pakis was infuriated by this senseless act of censorship. He retaliated by altering and re-releasing the Jazz Sniffer, renaming it the Sniff Jazzer. Curiously, all of the slanderous Glenn Miller content was retained. The only difference made was the singing rat. The popular Hispanic lady rodent was replaced with a deranged male. Once again, Glenn Miller sued, and this film was also banned, but the new rat turned out to be almost as popular as the female version. It slowly occurred to Pakis that he could team them up in the hopes of launching his first comedy duo. He envisioned them as a bickering couple. Slight physical alterations were made. He gave the female gapped teeth and he removed the tail of the male, reportedly just to have one less appendage to animate. But both rodents maintained their violent hunger for cocaine. They were initially called Glenn and Miller, but Glenn Miller learned about this before the release date and they were quickly changed. They became Cage and Alice, named for famed vaudevillian star Alison Cage, the human communist. Their first cartoon together was released in 1938, and it changed animation for days. Sorry, Cage, but you're on a better farm now. Dead cows and dead pigs and dead- Gutentag, I am understanding that you are into rabbits and heavy petting. Rats on cocaine became an instant thing that people didn't hate. The heady mix of drug abuse and domestic violence was ideally suited to this, the greatest generation. With the money made from this rodential double act, a paint set was purchased. Apocalypse Cartoons was now in color.
Rats on cocaine flourished. Men, women and children imitated Cage and Alice's reckless antics. Everyone was calling each other a cunt. Violence and drug use skyrocketed. Dean Packis couldn't be happier. And with the success came the inevitable merchandising. There were the rats on cocaine comic books, as well as wristwatches, lunchboxes, toys, cigarettes, cocaine straws, cunt skin caps. None of them sold, but they were for sale. Meanwhile, the storm clouds were looming. America had finally gotten around to entering World War II, and Apocalypse Cartoons was enlisted to make official films for the US government. Any Japs today? Japanese people, but who were entering any Japs today? Give us your Japanese, we'll put them in one of these. Give us all your sneaky yellow traders today. <laughs> After the war, Apocalypse Cartoons continued for some reason. Cage made a memorable cameo appearance in a feature film, dancing with Ginger Rogers in the hit musical Holocaust Ahoy. But the classic theatrical shorts always paired him with his perfect foil, Alice. She was dominant, conniving, and manipulative, but with the heart of a serial killer while he was a barely coherent mutant unable to contain his violent schizophrenia. Many of the greatest Rats on Cocaine episodes were produced in the 1940s and 50s. Often the plots involved them living in someone else's home and attempting to steal their cocaine, usually from under the watchful eye of a Sternhouse pet. We have to get that coke! Is he still out there? I don't know! Well, look! But soon, the beginning of the end would soon begin to end. For the first half of the 20th century, animated cartoons were only shown in movie theaters, usually before a feature film, as a sort of visual appetizer. However, a new medium was dawning. Television would forever change the course of cartooning. For many animation studios, the transition to the small screen proved difficult. It demanded much more content for far less money. Pakis produced several pilot programs of poor quality, which quickly failed. One show did prove to be a short-lived success, an irreverent blend of political satire and comic book style superheroes. It also circumvented the costly business of animating dialogue. Unfortunately, it became the victim of bad timing. Oh, I sure love being an immortal Kennedy. Should we go fight crime? Yes, but not because it is easy. You'll get yours, Kennedys. Ha ha! Foolish criminals! Bullets can't stop a Kennedy! After its abrupt cancellation in November 1963, Apocalypse Cartoons was running dry. Unable to get any new content on the air, the classic theatrical shorts were repurposed for television. All Pakis needed to provide was a rousing new opening theme song, which could be reused every week. Suck my dick, fuck you bricks, watch some old cartoon flicks. We don't really have to do anything because you did it all several seconds ago. But social moralities had drastically changed, 
and many of the old cartoons were heavily censored for television. Eventually, they disappeared altogether. But during the women's movement of the 1960s and 70s, Alice became an unlikely feminist icon. She was considered an early example of a strong and uncompromising female. And despite being paired with Cage, Alice was the leader in the relationship, as well as being the more popular and well-defined of the two characters. Capitalizing on her newfound interest, Apocalypse Cartoons was able to produce its first feature-length animated film, the quadruple X-rated Alice the Rat. There was Adam and Lily. What are you talking about, woman? Lily! God got rid of her because Adam didn't like her. Why? Because Adam liked to have sex on top of women. But Lily preferred to be the one on top. Like this. <laughs> That's not so gross. She also insisted on cunnilingus. And sometimes Lily would rub herself off really fast like this. And then her clip would get really big. I mean really big. Like a rhinoceros horn. And then she'd flip out him over and start fucking his asshole with it. Just fucking his asshole with her giant horn clip. Like some kind of deranged unicorn vagina. And this was a brand new asshole. He hadn't even taken his first shit yet. And she is just wailing away on this vulnerable little peach pit. However, it was deemed so disturbing, most theaters refused to screen it. Apocalypse Cartoons was lost and adrift. The characters were fondly remembered by some, but they simply didn't fit into this strange new age. The puritanical 1980s were sanitizing every loathsome and repugnant ideal that Dean Packis had spent a lifetime championing. He soon sank to his lowest depths. On crack babies, victims of their parents' plight. Rats on crack babies, with the help they'll win the fight. Rats on crack babies, there's we have to administer. Rats on crack babies, it's father and the sinister. But matters would get much worse. In 1986, an elementary school in Indiana detained a student after she was discovered to be carrying a gram of cocaine. Investigators soon learned that this four-year-old girl was actually the ringleader of a multi-million dollar drug smuggling empire with direct ties to Pablo Escobar. When the child was asked to account for her long history of addiction, bootlegging, bribery, kidnapping, manslaughter, and narco-terrorism, she claimed she learned it from watching rats on cocaine. Pandering politicians pounced on this paltry excuse. Dean Packis was called before a special congressional hearing accusing him of moral indecency. After years of fighting, they ultimately decided that the sale or possession of his cartoons would henceforth be deemed a punishable crime. And Pakis himself was legally declared an existential monster. Apocalypse Cartoon Studios closed its doors forever in 1988. After over half a century of adventures, the dream was over. The building was demolished and the ground where it stood was dug up and dropped into a volcano. History books were altered to erase references to Pakis and his works. Almost every print of every film he had ever animated was collected together and burned in a ritualistic ceremony overseen by Jerry Folwell and Philip Michael Thomas. Pakis himself was captured and frozen in carbonite. He was kept in the Smithsonian Institution where he spent a decade displayed in their Museum of Theatrical War Criminals. In 1999, he was auctioned off to an anonymous Saudi prince who released him in exchange for three wishes, none of which have ever been granted. Finally free, he marveled at the new technologies at his disposal. It was the 21st century. The internet was beginning to connect the world. Suddenly, any jumped-up little shit with a modem could become an animation studio. And Pakis was just such a shit. And so he began teaching himself digital animation. Boop. 
But he wasn't very good. Nonetheless, he continued. And in August of 2002, ApocalypseCartoons.com took its first tentative steps onto the World Wide Web. Hello! The internet became the ideal home for this motley stable of salacious scamps. Soon, Rats on Cocaine also returned, with Cage and Alice now living in a drug research laboratory. Suddenly, their coke addiction made contextual sense. You want my blood, bitch? Apocalypse Cartoons was back from the dead and ready to entertain a whole new generation of mostly Eastern Europeans. And to avoid the continuing political prohibition against them, all the cartoons are made available to watch completely free of charge. They can be seen on YouTube, Newgrounds, Vimeo, and some websites that sell black market ketamine. They've even eked their way back to the silver screen. Pacis's digital manipulations have been featured in some of the most prestigious film festivals with amusing titles to warn you how unpleasant their content is in the world. This has even resulted in actual accolades. People are bestowing awards to Apocalypse Cartoons, a studio that previous eras had attempted to destroy through legislation and exorcism. Yes, these indelible characters have clawed their way back to the top of the very bottom of relevance in the history of animation. But what do we know of the man behind them, reclusive billionaire Dean Packis? This strange, violet sphere of light with a faint skunk-like odor. Few people know anything about him, especially those that do. Some say he originates from the moon, and like the moon, can affect the tides of Earth but only by making them depressed and unable to cope with unforeseen difficulties. Others claim he's a marooned time traveler from the distant future, intentionally trying to antagonize the primitives who beleaguer him. We do know he's lived for over a century and never sired a child nor taken a mate. He currently lives alone on an undisclosed misty moor atop a tower constructed from the bones of Koreans who died animating shows for American children. We may never know the full truth about this mysterious orb who revels in the obscene like a swine astride its own effluent. But as long as he continues to refuse to die, the world of original, independent, and largely unseen animated cartoons will continue to have him near it. When you punch your fucking spouse, be they man or and claw their eyes and spray their spleen. If that bitch don't know their place, make them bleed out of their face.